welcome to another episode of the BS Podcast, the show that looks at how behavioral change insights are being applied in the wild. Episodes feature renowned behavioral experts across industries and organizations, from management and marketing to policy and public health, and more. Let's dive in and see what all the BS is about. Here's your host from The Behaviorist, Nick Hobson. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I yeah, I I, I went the the opposite way that you did because I had so many people saying, "What's this BS you're talking around?" So I decided B psi was the closest I was prepared to abbreviate. But I, I like the fact that you're normalizing BS as being okay. Christian Hunt is the founder of Human Risk Limited, a behavioral science consulting and training firm specializing in the fields of risk, compliance, conduct, and culture. He was formerly head of behavioral science at UBS, a role that was specifically created for him and coming out of a related position as head of compliance and operational risk control, UBS asset management. Prior to this, Christian was the chief operating officer of the Prudential (laughs) Regulation Authority, a subsidiary of the Bank of England, which is responsible for regulating financial services. Christian is also the host of a great podcast called The Human Risk Podcast, and it's a show to help BS practitioners, behavioral science practitioners, or as I believe you say, BSI, and researchers and innovative thinkers in the field of compliance, risk, and culture. Well, Christian, welcome to the show. And is it BSI? Is that how you pronounce... Or Bayside. It was. It was a talk about risk. It, it really was a risk. And as I decided sure. uh, to, well, look, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Summer, I, I know, firmly last, believe last that is I was like, the case. Yeah, maybe I'll do a podcast, and, and then and actually, think, no, the you know, name I, I came, came to me first, and then I was like, oh, that would be being perfect a for a podcast. So I worked in and then financial I decided services. To do this. So, I but it was a risk coming up with the with the whole BS thing. But I think I inadvertently became a compliance officer. But I do like face it. No one sets out to become a compliance officer. And and making the shift from regulator must stress post crisis. So I. Back in graduate the school, in we had our, that our had weekly brown bag meetings within the, the, the psychology there department, and there was um, ser- like serious and, uh, you know, having seen the way regulators about, were changing their it was piece, SPRG, uh, I and some people were like, is it Sprig? Kind of, is it Spur? On the other side, How do we pronounce it? And it was really, it was really UBS, two camps, so natural place and they go. hated each other. And what so I started to realize was the compliance is the business of influencing human decision making. So just to kick off, because organizations can't be the whole behavioral science in compliance ethics, but it's the people within them that you need to persuade. To do the right it's thing. one of those areas that I, and so you know, compliance that, is, is from my like position, a light bulb sort of moment. In, in our little we are trying to behavioral field, human field it's one of the ones that, that sort of. And I kind of went, um, why are we using well techniques known. that you wouldn't and, deploy and in any uh, other context sure to try and influence people? So, and if you look at what's gone so wrong right in financial behavioral services, interventions, so yeah, given that some of the listeners might not do what you want them to do, wondering if you can just give sort of a really high level summary. And, um, and of course, as we move through our conversation, they rely on presumptions about human decision making. But um, they maybe are just techniques the that notes you would to, never to use in any other context. And the light bulb moment for me came because lots of things were being done in my name. I was literally sending emails to myself, sending myself on very dull training courses, forcing myself to do processes that I thought didn't make sense. And I figured if if I have the word compliance in my job title and they don't make sense then uh, what's it going to do to people that really don't understand this stuff or, or don't care? 
And so this concept of bringing science to compliance, and of course it rhymes, so rhyme as reason effect in full action, uh, you know, that's, that's how I kind of stumbled across it. So I'm an, as, as many people, an accidental behavioral scientist who kind of recognized that things weren't working the way everybody thought they ought to. Uh, and I just thought there must be another way. And so I kind of began exploring what that other way might be. So look, I, I've always been curious about what makes people tick. And so I was one of those annoying kids who always used to ask why and, and kind of, you know, ask embarrassing questions. And my parents in, indulged it. And and I studied I studied literature at university. And the you know, UK education system is amazing because it allows you to go do things that are fun. And then and then you know, providing you don't want to be a brain scientist or something really technical, you can go study what you want and have have fun. And then and then employers know this and they will train you accordingly. And so I did uh, French and German literature, um, which, which of course is the study of people. And, you know, that's just a proxy. When, you, when you're reading literature, you're, you're trying to understand mm -hmm. the dynamics and the characters and why they do what they do. Because, of course, literature is all about people who <laughs> tend not to write books <laughs> yeah. about Love it. things that don't involve people. And so, so it started off there. And then, and then I got really boring and became an accountant to kind of try and counterbalance that. And, and then moved through to various pieces. And mm -hmm. I think along the way, I was always curious about, um, you know, people and, and what, that's what, a, that's what motivated them. Thank you. So if there were opportunities what, to go point, on courses, um, read books on you know, psychology, this, I guess in your, in your um, anything that related to sort of helping me understand what the hell was going on around me, year, I suppose, and, and, and particularly in my own behavior. Why was Did, I was doing it, weird was stuff that I knew wasn't the solution for you? Like what, what was happening? Did, and, was, it, and so was it a book? Was it a you know over time? It was a case of buying up with somebody. Why was that the and and then it just sort of all of a sudden came together. And I I you know I blame the kind of and I blame in a, in a really positive way the Dan Ariely's and the Kahneman's and those sort of um a pop science books that, that that demystified things a little bit and and spoke to me in in a language where I could translate it so I, I was interested in reading lots of technical things but but I sort of needed someone to translate it and I think one of the great skills particularly Dan Ariely has is is his ability to use language and examples that we all understand and so all of these things were coming together and, and, and Rory Sutherland was doing his, his pieces out there. And, and it wasn't so much that I had sort of suddenly went, oh, behavioral science is a thing. It was more that I had picked all these pieces up. And as I started to spot the weaknesses in what I was implementing and being required mm -hmm. to implement at work, that suddenly the light bulb came on that this stuff that I had found fascinating from a personal perspective wasn't just sort of slightly relevant to it. It was the core of what I was actually trying to do. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll dig in deeper. And, and you be very quickly become aware of the term behavioral science. Um, you know, and then you think, well, what's the difference between behavioral science and behavioral economics and so on and so forth. So I don't think there was a specific moment. It was, it's, it's been a longstanding piece, but I've always just sort of, I've always been fascinated by that thing. I would say probably, you know, when did I realize it was relevant to what I was doing? Probably we're going back to sort of 2015, 2016, the seeds started mm. to be sown. And then, and then I just started doing this stuff without badging it and realized that in order to, to get some impetus internally within the firm, you need, to have a, you need to have a name, you need to call it something. And everybody was talking about machine risk and cyber risk and, and you know, AI. And I kind of went, hold on a minute, people are really important here, right? Because when things go wrong, it's people that screw up. So I needed a brand. So I created this brand of human risk that I used internally just as a counterweight to all the noise around uh, technology and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of other forms of risk. And, and I defined human risk as the risk of people doing things they shouldn't mm -hmm. or not doing things they should, recognizing that activity and inactivity have equal, you know, it pose equal amounts of risk. We often think I can't be held responsible for something I haven't done wrong and, 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 and so this brand was born. So I sort of pushed human risk as the concept and behavioral science was the kind of the solution. So, so you had this big risk you were trying to mitigate. What could you do? Well, it, you also need a word for the solution and that's behavioral mm. science. And then you get the nice bringing science to compliance and it all sort of fits together. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> mm. So, so it, it it started way before then, in in the sense that I just started doing this stuff, because the moment you realise that the techniques you're deploying aren't working, you know, mm. if you have any intelligence whatsoever, you sit there and go, "This we've got to we've got to find a different way." And so I started to firstly enact things. Um, so, so a classic example would be one of the techniques that people often use in organisations mm. to ensure compliance is people aren't doing what we want, so we will send a reminder. You know, we'll send an email telling them what the policy says. And it's very logical. But of course, mm -hmm. that does several things. Firstly, it relies on the fact that people genuinely can't remember, which is often not the case. Often they know what the rules say, but there's other reasons for non-compliance. So you're, mis you're misdiagnosing the problem potentially. And if it is the fact they haven't remembered, then whose fault is that? Is it the organization that hasn't taught them in a way that's memorable? Or is it the individual's fault? And of course, organizations like to do things that's convenient for them. So if yep. we can send everybody an email, and it's quick, easy, it's so done. It's at that point, you, you were at on paper. UBS. And but of course, in, it's terrible bio, for the communication. It was sort of this role so of behavior what I science. What I wanted to do when I was once remind, uh, asked to send a, for you. a reminder what were those, email, they often you know, asked heads of compliance. I'm assuming that's sort of the time when all this started to come together. And of course, if it's What were those initial conversations with the internal stakeholders and your immediate managers? But what did that look like? And what was the general receptivity? Because one, I think it's ineffective. But two, if you think about the impact on the target audience, and given your audience, mm. I'll just say the words now, negative social proof, right? So I, if I send an email saying to everybody, the executive committee has noted the large number of breaches of this particular policy, this is unacceptable. What I'm basically doing is sending a message to those people that are compliant that loads of other people aren't. Because if, if there weren't loads of people, not, you, know, you wouldn't send an email unless it was a widespread problem. So the people that are compliant will get at best irritated and worst case might actually, if you can't beat them, join them, you know, response to it. And of course, the people that have been non-compliant will subliminally say, well, this is good because I'm not the only person because they wouldn't have sent the email if it wasn't widespread. Yeah. So it fails, I think, on very basic tests because it doesn't understand how people might react to it. And of course, it's not a solution to the problem because what you're doing is you're kind of you're dealing with something that's already occurred. What you're going to find is if you don't change the infrastructure around that, it's going to happen again, because because by dint of the fact that you needed to remind the first time that you're going to have to remind them again. So it's not effective. It's hugely irritating. It's massively you know time consuming in terms of writing the email. People tend to delete it. And so you don't solve the problem. And so I said, I will not send an email out like that because I just recognize. It. So so you, you reframe it. And you don't talk about the breach and you say, you know, here's, here's a, we, you know, we have this policy, here's the rationale behind the policy. So make it salient to the individual, try and find an angle that makes it relevant to the individual you're sending it to. So they think it's in their mm -hmm. interest to comply and, and, and then point out to them, you know, but we recognize it can sometimes be challenging. So here's some things we've done to improve the situation. And there's always something that you've done somewhere along the line to make things better. And you can then give them some sort of, you know, and, and here's five things you need to remember. And you can highlight the things that people are breaching the policy for without pointing out mm -hmm. it's a breach. And make it make people recognize that, you know, you're on their side, that you recognize this thing, and you're doing what you can to make it easier. Mm -hmm. And it was the first compliance email I'd ever sent to anyone where I had people knocking on my door going, thank you so much for that. That was really helpful. And of course, it wasn't helpful. It was a patronizing reminder of the rules framed in a, in a, in a slightly different way. And so I started to look at things like that and just say, what can I do? And of course, in large organizations, even when you're a global head of a function, you still have limited powers. And there are always you know, stakeholders that, there that, that, that sort of control processes that you mm -hmm. don't have a limited say. And so I, I was sort of restricted a little bit in what I could do. So along with just doing this stuff and, and, and trying it, and, and we're not in RCT territory here. We are just literally hands-on going, this process is terrible. Let me try something that I know will improve it. And, and, you know, to the extent you can, you run RCTs and test these things out. But actually, the, the level of the quality of what, what, what was going on was so poor in some cases, so obviously wrong, that anything one did was likely to improve it. So I started to do those sorts of things. And at the same time, through this human risk brand, was doing presentations, pointing out things within the organization that perhaps weren't as smart as they could have been and, and, and highlighting the ways I was looking at these techniques. And of course, if you point out to people 
that the way things are being done, you know, has potential downsides and that there might be a better way to do it. People are quite interested because it's a constructive way of challenging the organization rather than just going, this is terrible. I have a solution in a way of thinking about it that might help explain some of the reasons why we're not getting the outcomes we expect. And so I began that process and and I, I guess I sort of pushed things a little bit too far because yeah. my boss kind of said, you know, really like this, how do you fancy doing this full time? And my intent had been to kind of build slowly. Uh, yeah. and, and so I sort of potentially overcooked it slightly and found myself in this position where I was, 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 was given the opportunity to kind of uh, deliver uh, across that piece and, and, and sort of put my money where my mouth was. And, 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 you know, it hadn't been something I'd planned. But when you're given that kind of opportunity, you take it. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, I think it's interesting because actually, I, mm-hmm. I, there's a, there's a middle step mm-hmm. there. So I think which you had is, obviously you, you had the insight certainly for my story. I recognized something wasn't the, the working. Traditional and the traditional and sometimes was done it was just intuitive, was an intuitive sense of irritation. You had, sometimes for, for whatever it was reason, you were getting guy, Obviously, you sort of because realized people would come and tell you, and that's something different. Or they you would see that they weren't doing what you wanted into the quirks. So you'd have that identification point and behavior, and and then you just think about then took all of the language where. Uh, and and the, you know, the, people the were trying to achieve the same end, but in from the different the areas and the and so that Sutherlands and the, and the Thaler and Sunstein's, and then all of a sudden it became so transport a usable London, formal very, framework. Very very good at this stuff. Uh, and, and UK listeners brand. don't laugh, and I've heard you might that think they're a terrible story, so that so many, but they're actually it's really good at using psychology and I'd like to hear more and more. Just to behave really well, where somebody just says, "So I started to look. This was the old way of doing it. It was flawed for a number of reasons because it just really didn't understand human cognition or human emotion." Human network, behavior, but it's and then we sort of did it this this other way. Oh, so and this other way, there's a whole you know, it becomes behind people's that, reality. That's now just kind and of so I coming out of the these parallels, and I was I was kind of looking so it's, around it's BDI common, for um, you know, what techniques are advertisers using, what and I wonder, and I'm sure using, that they and do. Of course, that takes you I wonder if Dan and other people and other people do even realize the impact that these books and it was then that having having sort of seen those other examples, I then looked for some explanations as to what the hell was going on. Why 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 did this seem to be more? Why were people spending millions on this technique? Um, uh, and 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 then and then the mm. science comes in and gives you, I think, the explanations and the vocabulary, and and the scientific backdrop that's there. So I think that real life thing that's there was a critical piece, certainly in my bit, because it allowed me to see that I was, you know, it, it gave me a real world example. I wasn't just kind of thinking theoretically. I could practically see that other people were solving it, and then you can then you can jump into the academic and the research piece that, that that explains it. And that's why you need the gateway around simple explanations in everyday language that allows you to make the leap between what you're seeing in other case studies and the the realities of of um, you know your own situation. <sighs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Mm. 
So, I mean, this fascinates me because I, I think, you know, all too often the narrative that organizations use for non-compliance is we, it's a bad person doing bad things because that's nice and easy. It means the organization doesn't have to take responsibility short of, you know, we shouldn't have hired them in the first place, but we, we can yeah, blame yeah. the individual. And on we your can website, frame you, the you, you have this being great, around that individual um, as a bad person, messaging, rather than uh, having that, to look and organizationally and say, quote, well, how might their best we have people contributed are inspiring, to that creative, wrongdoing? courageous, inspirational, and, and my thesis is always, you know, this is the classic, at their worst, classic they are evil, thing that you've got the very small percentage of people lazy, that are out there intentionally doing bad things, and then you've got the very small percentage of people that are agree more good things and the right thing, and then the rest of us kind of sit in the middle and are influenceable influenceable psychology the way, depending on the range of circumstances. Do now, and so it's because I, I always I wrestled with that, that apparent of, contradiction of sort of good and evil, is and I got into like existential philosophy. And I started so if I look at Nietzsche when I was a young, tales, angsty, you know, look at movies, early twenties university we student. We have these kind of um, and, and here's, here's opposite a bit, that allow not us to, get to too philosophical the story. on you, but and then and then it's interesting when we start to blend those things and we have the kind of the flawed hero or the the villain that actually does something quite good that's unexpected to to mess with those dynamics compliance and and so. So I think this narrative of, of sort of good versus evil is baked into a whole host of things. You can see it in religion as well, that we just naturally carry through. And, and I think it's a simple codification of the world in the same way that you could argue economics. It's, a, it's an attempt to explain these things. And it's easier for us to understand mm. things as, as simple extremes rather than, than the kind of the, the complexities and nuances in, in, in the middle. And and for me, this narrative became really critical because uh, you needed you know needed to debunk it slightly and say, look, actually, if we want to understand why people aren't doing what they're doing, we cannot just pigeonhole all the people that haven't done what we want as being one hundred percent responsible for what's happened. We need to partly take responsibility. And so I very quickly get into the you know what has the environment done to to influence the humans, and in most cases in the, in the compliance sphere it starts to get pretty obvious because you say to yourself, well, you know, don't be surprised when people don't read a 500 page policy that actually doesn't answer their question. Don't be surprised when you send them on a training course that's super dull, that again, actually makes the world seem really simple. So in financial services, people are sent on training to teach them about things like, you know, uh, anti-money laundering. So money laundering, big risk for firms, reputationally, but also from a regulatory perspective, we don't want to be facilitating money laundering. So what happens is you send people on a course and you basically say money laundering is bad. And then you give them a case study that's really simple, which is, uh, you know, your client has come into a room and he has brought his brother who has a suitcase full of money that he says he found, you know, in a shed. Sort of utterly implausible situation. Or if it is plausible situation, you would kind of go, this seems a bit weird. I'm going to ask some questions. But that's how people are trained in this black and white world. And of course, that doesn't mirror the realities of the world. They come in. People tend not to screw up when it's absolutely crystal clear and black and white. I mean, they can, but typically speaking, it's in the gray areas. And we pretend in the compliance field that the world is black and white. We pretend in the way that we train people. We pretend in the way that we write the rules. And we pretend in the way that we kind of react to wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. It's all in this binary thing. You're either good or you're bad. And so to, 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 to sort of come, you know, come back to your point is I... Uh, recognize that that dynamic didn't reflect the reality of the world that I was in. And so I started to try and look for some answers. And I think literature probably helped a little bit in this because I'd already got used to the fact that the world was a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. And and you see, you know, the best kind of bits of literature have, have, you know, aren't just this black and white. You know, we all love a good sort of James Bond movie where there's an obvious goodie and a baddie. But the more sophisticated bits of, 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 of literature challenge us in different ways and, and, and sort of throw us curveballs, which I think more matches the reality of the world that we're in.
ね。わ<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>、wow. That's that's great, and even I remember. I actually remember, like five, ten years ago, I, I would be hitting my head on the desk trying to come up with testable hypotheses. Like I, you know, in my master's thesis, let's say, I was like, I need to come up with a research proposal. I need to come up with a study idea, and I, I would, I would read. Um, when I say literature, I mean like I'd read the academic literature. I'd read like the science, and I'd be like, okay, what's what's a future direction? What's the next step that I need to take that I can do with this? And I just I was just getting nowhere. And I've I've always loved reading, you know, literature, right. literature, and like sort of like you know the Dostoevskys and those things. And oftentimes, more often than not, I would get inspiration for a study idea in those stories than in the science.、Um, And it's something that I have to re remind myself even now. If I'm sort of hitting a wall and trying to figure something out, I'll say, "Put down the science, put down the technical readings, and go go pick up,、um, you know, a, a Dickens novel and just read that." Because there's, <laughs> as to your point, there's it's just it's full of little insights and stories of of human complexity and psychology.、Um, So I, well, I love so, that. So I、and、think the, the, the first thing、so、to true, say the, is it, that the, the black and white. You can only have a conversation with people who want to have a conversation. There's so much more gray、so、than I am. Than, you know, than, you know I, I, I cannot. If, if somebody thinks the way they、and、are I've never running of, their I'm not compliance totally program, totally aware and familiar with the amazing and is working well.、Um, area it's very difficult to have a conversation. But it seems that. And, not, and of course, I, the reason they think that is they haven't.、So、you know, my my thesis would be they haven't yet detected. Pre-behavioral science. So you may think traditional. You know, there's nothing. Your your organization is completely fine. Nothing to see here. Thinks in this very practical way. I would argue you just haven't、way. found it yet. And it also reminds me so of the Francesca people、Gino、I'm talking to typically, work, the people, where, and I'm happy to engage yeah, with people. Anybody wants to, to engage me on that says, and, you know, and say、um, I think it's perfect. You know, people, it's not happy to moral, have people who are more important. People, people, people ordinary people recognizing there's a, there's a moral standard. And I, and, very and, often and I sort of look at it in slightly crude quote, terms, unquote, which is immoral behavior. Take the analogy of alcoholism because they don't they don't know exactly. You either go to get therapy and help if you recognize yourself you have a problem. Hold in two different directions, or if there has been an intervention by the family or a medical practice. Question is, and so the way I look at those two things is to that say, narrative you've only got people that, is that, that either instinctively know something's not worked out, or they've had、bad. a problem. So how do you navigate and, that? And with, you can really talk to people when when their compliance framework has not broken down, down, hasn't worked the way they Russian expected. Russian literature, and, they're keen and, to have an answer, and, and existential and philosophy. So that's just that's just two nerds. Just, just you and I talking about、moment. this stuff right now. The other people how, how, how with the intervention like, is you know regulators, auditors, or maybe your competitor had something happen that. That forces you to think a little bit more about your piece. So typically, what I'm doing is engaging with、mm. people that have a willingness to learn around why I think you know it's, it's almost they've got to the point that I got to, and and I'm just helpfully here saying I have a potential way of looking at this that you might find appealing and interesting. <laughs> And now, for a short breather, a break from all the BS. For newcomers to the show this week and last, welcome to our little growing behavioral science community. You can find all episodes on your usual podcatcher programs, as well as on the website www.behaviorist.biz/bspodcast. For any direct feedback, comments, questions, criticisms, you can always reach out to me personally at. nhbehaviorist at gmail dot com, and remember to subscribe on iTunes Podcast or wherever else you get your podcast fix. And if you like what we're doing, a rating and review would go a long, long way. 
Thanks so much. That's it. Now back to all this risky business with Christian Hunt. And then, and then the conversation then shifts very quickly into, you know, when I talk about things that aren't working, the worst possible thing to do would be to come in and go, you've got this all wrong. You're terrible. You're a bunch of idiots. You know, this isn't, this is because I need them to own the solution and I need them to feel agency in what's happening. And, and as we know, behaviors are complex. So what I don't want to do is come in and say, here is your playbook. And that's often sometimes people expect that. And they kind of go, come in and tell me how to control my, you're a people person. Tell me how to control these people. And, and of course, sometimes there are obvious things that they could do differently that will improve things. But more often than not, we're in the, we're in the realms of we need to try various things and, and, and see what works in your particular context. Um, uh, but, but the way that I get them into the journey is to, is to tell stories about other contexts. So find things that are analogous to what they, what they are looking to solve and to explore how those work. And ideally, you get people to make the connection themselves. Mm-hmm. Much more powerful, obviously, if they if they if they come up with the idea themselves. Now, I may lead the witness slightly in terms of the way I present things and the stories that I tell, but I try to replicate what you were talking about from a literature perspective with examples from uh, what I'll unfairly call the real world, so outside their particular context, and that's where exploring, you know, what does Transport for London do, exploring what do advertisers do. Uh, finding, you know, historic, maybe, maybe it's an example from history. Mm. And there are lots of, you know, interesting historical examples where if you are creative enough, you can find something that will resonate in terms of the human behavior. And the delightful thing, of course, is that humans, uh, you know, we, we, we don't seem to always learn from the past. And so we're constantly making mistakes. So there's, there's lessons from history. There are lessons from I mean, current affairs is really powerful. Mm. So if you look at some of the sort of, uh, you know, whether it's, it's incidents in sport whether it's incidents in the news, uh, whether it's other companies that have had something, you can find lots of examples of things not working the way people thought they could and, 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 and outcomes that people didn't want to have happen, happening. Mm. And if you can find something that's got enough of a parallel, you can hook people in. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of storytelling as a powerful mechanism because, of course, that's what we, we grow up with. We are taught stories. And, and as kids, we are, you know, it's very interesting, back to your black and white thing, as kids, we are taught tales to help us navigate a world that we haven't seen. And so one of the things I think is interesting is assume you have a normal childhood. Everybody around you generally cares about you and has your best interests at heart. So you won't have come across evil people. And I need to make sure as, a, as, a, as an adult teaching a child that you understand that not everybody is nice. So how do I do that? I create some extreme characters and, 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 and tell that tale. So the same technique, mm. I think it help, helps engage people, find things you know, it can be song lyrics, it can be a, a TV show, it can be anything to engage people with a, an analogous situation where one, they don't have to, to, to feel so bad themselves because we can be, you know, if you, if you open people's eyes to stuff, they can suddenly go, oh, well, we've got everything wrong. And of course, that's not the mm. case. Um, but it's a way of kind of bringing it in and making it relatable to people without them feeling a sense of shame or embarrassment uh, because they're not going to want to hear from somebody that every single thing they've done mm-hmm. is wrong. Do you, do you ever come across, you know, in just having a conversation, be it with a prospect or, or a current client or, or anyone for that matter, where you'll point out a, a lesson in, in history? So yeah, I'm thinking the obvious one recent is the financial crisis, 2008, or maybe there's a breach in, like, as you said, in one of their main competitors and all of a sudden their, their ears perk up and they go, oh, they go, oh, that's interesting. That's happened over there. Is, is there this bias in place where they convince themselves whether on a conscious or unconscious level that oh that would never happen to us <laughs> they sort of they sort of dismiss it when of course if it, it's 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 plausible that it could happen to them but they it, it's almost like they it's a they're deceiving themselves they don't they refuse to think that something so terrible could happen so it's so they're just like sw- sweep it under the rug so how do you how do you overcome that barrier it's just like you said through 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 storytelling and and, and general yeah it's, it's you're absolutely right it's it's sort of it's very easy if, if you find something that's contemporaneous that is one of their competitors mm. uh they could find a multitude of reasons right which is you know well that's a different business uh that's you know they they, they they've had problems in the past their culture's all wrong uh, you know, brackets, they're a bunch of idiots, yeah, yeah. you know, however you wanted to frame it, they, they, you could sort of end up with that, that piece. And, and so I tend to prefer things that are a little bit easier for people to grasp because they're a bit further away. So, so here's, you know, my, one of my favorite mm. examples of human risk in action is a gentleman called Brian Cullinan. And, and 
people may not remember the name, but you will probably remember what Brian did. And we're going back to 2017 at the Oscars. Mm. Brian was a partner for PwC. <laughs> His job is to hand out envelopes. And the story concludes with Brian handing out the wrong envelope for the biggest award of the night, which is best movie. And he has to then retract and so on. Now, that's the sort of story where you would go, I would never be that dumb. But but interestingly, you know, he, this is an experienced partner in a professional services firm. And it's a professional services firm, by the way, that tells other people how to build control frameworks and audits other people. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole number. And, and if you look at it, you, you just go, here was somebody operating who's very experienced. Mm-hmm doing something that was fundamentally silly. And of course, why did that happen? Well, the answer is hubris. You know, he got, he was tweeting backstage. He got a bit carried away. He'd actually done interviews the week before saying how hard this, it looks really easy, but it's really difficult. And and the very thing that lets him down is actually a backup. So they've built contingency into this to make sure nothing can go wrong. And what does he do? He hands out the contingency envelope for a different award at the time at which the biggest award is there. Highly, highly, highly embarrassing. And yet you've got a, a, you know, a very simple piece here that says here is a senior person failing in, a, in, in possibly the most, you know, it's, like the, it's the worst possible thing that could happen. And it, it, it actually occurred there. And I pick that sort of example because everybody can visualize it. You understand it. And you say, well, how could they have dealt with it better? Well, the answer is you don't want to have a, a partner shouldn't be handing out envelopes. That's not what they do. Mm. He should have a junior person, ideally someone who hates movies, who doesn't want to be there, <laughs> who views it as a tedious bureaucratic thing, right? You know, couldn't think of anything worse than hanging out backstage at the Oscars, who will just diligently do what they're yeah. told. You don't want someone who is sort of thinks they're a movie star because they're on the side of a stage with a load of other movie stars. And I think there's a simple example where you can say, look, you know, we can all kid ourselves that we're not Brian, but but actually we can all find ourselves doing that and and I I tend to pick examples of silly you know tell stories silly things I do we all we've all bought things that we don't mm. need we've all paid over the odds we've all been conned in some way shape or form and we've all made piss poor decisions and and I and I try and also you know if I, I come with my own stories because there's nothing more powerful than someone kind of prostrating themselves and going okay I'll take you know if you don't want it if you if you're infallible that's fine I'm not and here's where I screwed up I like that that's that's, that's great um and what if, if you can what would a sort of typical engagement now look like for you what what you know is there is there a specific industry or is it just you know does it is it compliance and risk management across the board are you run, like going in and running audits or diagnostics from like obviously like more behavioral diagnostics and doing these assessments? What what sort of just to you know paint a bit of a picture for for listeners? What type of work you'd be engaging in? Yeah, so so the, the, the key thing that I come in to help people with is their control framework, loosely defined, isn't mm-hmm. working. And so so that might be uh, compliance. You might you might have some rules that you need to comply with because regulations require it. Or it might be that actually from, a, from an internal perspective, what's important to your organization culturally for business success purposes, whatever, uh, you know, it, things aren't happening the way you want them to, to, to happen. And so I, I talk about risk and compliance as a core focus, but I also get into topics like conduct. So that's a, a, a sort of term for behavior. And, and, and in financial services, there is conduct regulation. That's how you do business. But it also takes you into ethical dilemmas. So I have people coming and saying, we had something went wrong in our organization. And we thought we had this under control, but we recognized there were human aspects to what went wrong. Uh, and clearly, ethics will always have a human mm-hmm. component to it. Uh, and, and we don't want that to have happen again. How can we, one, you know, what, what do we need to do to clean this piece up? And I'm, I'm not there to kind of reprogram your IT systems. I'm there to think about what are the drivers within your control framework that means, one, this happened, but secondly, what else could happen? And so how do you activate your population to think about things? And so looking at everything from what's the what you know what's your recruitment process, what's your induction training look like? Very, very important induction mm. training because it sets the tone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really I look at the aspects of their control framework and kind of work with them to, to find a solution. So I, I, you know, this isn't about coming in with a prepackaged solution. It's really about saying, let me help you put the goggles on to think about this mm-hmm. stuff. Because what I try to do is, is make sure that they have a, not only a sustainable solution for the problem they're trying to solve, but also an understanding of how they could start to think about it themselves. And are they coming to you, and, sorry to interrupt, are they, are they coming to you because something bad has already happened or there's a risk of a breach or now they're concerned? Or is it more pro, or are, they, are you coming in at a point that's a bit more proactive? Both. Yeah. Um, 
it is it's 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 you know it's, it very much depends on the individual piece i mean to answer your sector question i have a financial services background um a lot of people come you know from within that industry but i've also got people coming from outside saying look the experience you have in financial services is potentially highly relevant to us particularly if it's an industry that has been uh subject to sort of regulatory interventions uh, or they think it's going to get worse or maybe you're not regulated at the moment but you you think you will be so a lot of tech companies may start out with no thoughts around compliance mm-hmm. at all you know um the the and uber would be a great example classically set up to try and uh, arbitrage rules arbitrage regulations and kind of ignore them and 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 and, and you know build things that are technologically feasible but actually, ultimately, regulation will catch up with you. And if you're not used to handling regulation, um, your you know your ways of engaging with it could could be quite challenging. So, so the, so the skill set I'm really bringing is thinking, particularly in regulated industries, but also in 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 others where there may be some form of external pressure. So, not only are you trying to solve the problem, but you have to explain it to someone else. So, you have to do something that will pass muster with your regulator, mm. that will pass the auditor's test. That will, you know, that, that will that will solve not just the actual problem, but the the the, the dynamics mm-hmm. around it. And so I come in and and really help people identify. And and those people that haven't had the big blow up, um, you know, who are proactively thinking, well, I'm I'm worried about this, how this might happen. Those people, you can always find something that isn't working. Mm-hmm. So look for we, you know, a weakness in a control framework is is lots of people breaching a policy. So so you can come in and say, what is not happening the way you expected it to happen. And then we can start to analyze why and look at aspects of the process that, that aren't, aren't functioning. The other sorts of engagement are there is a new regulation that's come along, which gives an opportunity. There's a little bit of blank blank piece of paper when you've got a new regulation you haven't thought of before mm. that might allow you to start with a behavioral uh, lens from, from the, the beginning. beginning. And of course, that's much easier than trying to unpick or change something that's happened in the past, particularly because you don't have... Um, uh, you have less personal engagement around it. If you're coming in and the people you're speaking with have designed the very framework that isn't working, uh, that's quite a tough thing because ultimately what you're ending up doing is saying, look, the, you, you've gone about this the wrong mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. And so it's easier to do it when there's, a, when there's a blank sheet of paper piece. So the sorts of assignments I do is everything from from kind of uh, what you might term sort of emergency services coming in and, and, and helping where something's gone wrong. Uh, earlier stage where people want things to, you know, they, they, they recognize there's some dynamics that, that, that could be better. Uh, there is a cost benefit. I don't like leading with this, but many of the controls that are out there look good on paper, but are terrible in practice. So a good mm. example would be a pre-approval. Many industries require a compliance function to pre-approve mm-hmm. something. And that can be very sensible um, if it is something that the compliance function is capable of approving. So you you need, a, you know, conflicts of interest would be a good example. If we're doing a transaction that has a conflict of interest, somebody independent looking at it makes a lot of sense because we can't, we struggle with our own conflicts of interest. We will always find reasons why those conflicts mm-hmm. don't exist. So, so in those cases, it makes sense to have a third party looking at it. Uh, if it's something high risk, maybe like like payments, where you want somebody to just just check that you've got the calculation right before you send money off to the wrong place, that that makes sense. But in many cases, um, the approval process is either misunderstood um, or, or or is sort of enacted in a manner that adds no mm. value. So if the pre approval process is just a box ticking exercise, and the compliance function is giving the person who is asking for the approval effectively an insurance policy because they will say when things go wrong, ah, oh, but we ran it past compliance. And of course, many things that might go wrong sit in ethical spheres such as, um, you know, just because you're legally allowed to do a piece of business doesn't mean it's a good idea from an ethical mm-hmm. perspective. And in financial services, there's often approval processes, which is, you know, have we disclosed all the things that we should disclose? Well, a compliance officer can see what you've disclosed, so they can see errors of commission, what you've put in there. They can't see what you haven't Mm. said. Is there some aspect of the product that you should have disclosed before it was put in the marketplace? And so we need to think about, is is our, this is where, you know, behavioral piece comes in. Have we put in place a control that sends a signal to the person whose activity we are controlling that we have mitigated risk that we haven't? Mm. And are they taking false comfort from that? Are Are they ignoring... Uh, telltale signs because they assume that we have covered things that we haven't. Hmm. 
And actually, there was you brought up the sort of commission. It, what carries greater risk? And maybe the answer is it depends. But is it the the activity or the the commission, or is it the inactivity, the the the, the, um, the omission? Which which one sort of carries more of a more of a burden or more of a risk? Would you say? Yeah, I I always think it's the omission. Mm-hmm. Right, because I think we are, you know, I'll, I'll, let, let me channel some Kahneman here and just say, you know, we are, we're, we're very aware of things that we know. We, we don't think so much about the things that we don't know. And I think it's, it's much, you know, forgetting to do something comes with a much greater risk than, than, than doing something. And I think control frameworks typically look for problems. You know, if we think about how we police behavior, we're on the lookout for things. Have a look and see what's going on. You're not thinking about what's not mm-hmm. happening. It's much easier. It's much and harder to point to because you just it's, can't see it. It's sort of invisible. It's hidden. Right. Right. And so, 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 to my mind, I think it's it's not that you know both can be equally dangerous, but I think we are not naturally predisposed to think about what we don't know. You know, we build frameworks. We we get reports out of those frameworks, and and often organizations, when you're thinking about controlling behavior and monitoring your staff's behavior. And even your customer's behavior or supplier's behavior, you will take the data that is available to you and you'll use that to monitor it. You won't often think, what data do I not have? So what is this not mm-hmm. telling me? And, and, and often, system, particularly with in long-established organizations, the data sets that they have available were not designed with this in mind. So systems weren't built to allow them to do the sorts of analysis that you might in the 21st century include if you were building the system afresh. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of management information, uh, you know, stuff that filters up to senior level dashboards is a view of the world that is missing a whole load of stuff. And very often we don't sit in a meeting and think, what is this not telling me? What's not on here? We look at what's on the piece of paper in front of us and focus and have a discussion around that. And we feel good about that. It's much harder to say, what is it we can't see? What's not in here? And, and you know, I think many of the corporate structures that are in place do not help us think outside the box and think about alternatives. So a good example being minutes of meetings. You turn up to a meeting and the first thing you do is review the minutes of the previous meeting. That frames the whole of the meeting that follows in the context of what happened last Mm -hmm. time. And and you're basically asking, it's Groundhog Day. And so don't be surprised when these things don't, you know, risk committees don't identify new risks because they're just in this routine of looking at things and not thinking about the things they can't Mm. see. So maybe maybe that's where... The behavioral scientist and the, the the behavioral science lens sits is in that is in that side of the inactivity, um, whereas maybe some of the other the infrastructure that the and, and the data and the technology and the digital products can can help with the activity or the commission, because I think I think there's something there where, you know, if you don't see it, how do you how do you know? But you need somebody to sort of uncover what's really lurking, you know, lurking behind this behind the behind the the shadows, so to say. Yeah, I think it's it's also in the in the commission because of uh, the justifications that we use. That's to do true. Things. After the fact, and we'll confabulate and and post hoc rationalize our actions. Right. So so I think I think it has it has a you you're right. There's a difference between the two. I think we can use it on both sides of the of the totally. sort of fence, totally. Like. The, there's uh, to, to, to shift a little bit. There's sort of a turn, you know, in the, I'd say in the last five years or so, and maybe that's because of the of the of the whole financial crisis but you know there's attention to more attention to compliance there's also this like you know uh, an, an eye to corporate social responsibility and social innovation and purpose before profit and all these sort of like nice things that are happening in organizations including you know financial services and pro- professional services do you sense you know cuz you've been in this industry you know well before 2008 and then after now do, do you see that shift in impacting individual behavior whether it's employees or or leadership is there is is that shift real or is it just sort of uh is is it all a a facade no look it's happening i think there are some institutions that understand the way the wind is blowing and recognize they need to mm-hmm. change and are doing everything they can to, 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 to kind of pivot into that space, recognizing that many legacy structures, you know, whether that's your recruitment process, whether that's your promotions process, whether that's the way you encourage challenge within the organization, you know, many of them have some way to go and, and are, you know, well behind the curve on, 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 on even basic diversity stats. But there are many others, I think, that, that are, you know, struggle with that, 
piece and are clinging on to legacy practices. And we are, you know, I do see examples of people kind of being the blockbuster video with Netflix around the corner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's understandable. You have a branch network that you're running if you're a traditional bank and you've got your traditional client base and, and that's, it's an annuity play. It's working quite nicely for you. It keeps going. And there are huge barriers to entry for, for competitors. So why do you need to change? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the answer is that, those dynamics are shifting very quickly. So wealth is being handed on to younger generations. There are, uh, you know, competitors out there who are doing things better, more efficiently, more effectively. And of course, if you're a large financial services institution, you've historically thought of threats as being things that look like you. So big banks. But of course, what happens in the, in the competitive landscape is that you've got, you know, nobody is going to come and build another mega bank. What they do is they'll come and do a very small slither of activity mm -hmm. That they'll eat a little bit of your lunch and lots of people eat little bits of your lunch. And, and so I see these dynamics as being critical. So I think if these organizations want to survive, they need to be on top of this agenda. And I think there's something really interesting. This is another area I, I, I sort of work in is to say people within organizations are very good forward looking indicators of risk. Right. When things go wrong, somebody somewhere within the organization knew as well as the perpetrator. Right. There's some things that you can spot. And, and, and so there's internal views, but there's also external. So, you know, typically we don't turn when, when it comes to measuring risk to our youngest people that join the organization. Mm. But actually, I think in a traditional organization, a CEO that's been with the organization for 25, 30 years is not going to be very well cited on 21st century risk. You know, the risks from social media, the risks from cryptocurrency. And so we need to start tapping people across the organization as having insight as to as, as to what's happening and and that for me isn't happening so i think there is a huge uh underutilization of brain capacity and and cognitive ability and knowledge and experience and understanding because there is a shift going on now which is experience and tenure don't necessarily equip you to deal with the dynamics of the 21st century you will not be wise in all areas in a way that the structure of the organization suggests mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. great one final question for you, if you don't mind. Of course. So this is called the BBB, the Big Behavioral Brainstorm. Um, of all the, of all the problems, and you know this can be outside of your your uh, field of expertise or within either one. Um, of all the problems that are out there in the world, in society, in organizations, etc., uh, which one do you see uh, needing a, a behavioral science intervention or a, or a, a behavioral insights approach? So look, the, I think the honest answer to this is, is clearly the environment is the biggest issue facing us. But I know that I, I, I love the show, by the way, so I've listened to it many. I know that many of your guests have grabbed that one. So let me, let me pick something, having parked that as genuinely what I think the core one. I think the most important thing that we're not doing is maximizing human capital. Mm. And it's, this, is, this does sit sort of in, in, in my space, which is to say that in the 21st century, technology is moving very quickly. It's taking over roles that humans have traditionally done. And the role of human beings going forward is going to be very different. And, and I'm not a buyer of the robots are going to steal all of your jobs, but there will, be a, there will be an element of that. So as we look at what people are going to be doing going forward, they are going to be doing slightly different things, things that machines can't do, things that require emotion, um, in, in, intuition, um, you know, communication skills. Um, the, the, and so if we want to succeed and solve a lot of societal problems and, and for businesses to succeed, we need to get the most out of our mm. people. And so I think many of the corporate structures don't do that. We hire people because they're allegedly smart in most cases, and yet we, we treat them as if they're dumb. And we don't get the most out of people. And, and, and so I bring diversity and inclusion into that space. So I would like to see behavioral scientists running all over organizations and saying, where are we not maximizing our human capital? And rather than focusing on the downsides of employing people, which is a lot of what I do, <laughs> we, we need to focus on the upsides and the potential. And we need to free and liberate people. And we don't do that with our structures. We don't do that with literally the physical environment we put people in, with the way employment contracts work. We are still treating people as a, you know, human resources sums it up as a resource. Yeah, so, yeah. And I would love to see us treating people as, as, you know, being far more than that and offering far more, but we need to free that capacity. And I think behavioral science can hugely help them do that. Well, here, here, that's a, that's a wonderful uh, closer. And I, I'll just requote you there. Behavioral, I would love to see behavioral scientists running around organizations. 
I, I would I would as well. I think that'd be a great thing for 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 all of us <laughs> and for and for organizations in general. Uh, Christian, thanks so much. This was this was fantastic. Um, really really great to have you on. And and uh, it, it's you do a. I mean, we've talked before, but you do a fantastic job of of distilling down, you know, cause this is a little bit, a little bit more complex stuff when it comes to, to behavioral science and behavioral insights. Um, at least for me, maybe my listeners are like, well, this, this is obvious, but, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a, it's a real pleasure and, 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 and you do a, a quite convincing job of it. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And, and look, when you when you start with the word compliance in your job title, you know you're onto a challenging piece. <laughs> and and somebody once described me as an explainer, and I thought that was highly insulting. But then I realised actually that, that there is a skill I think in in bridging gaps. And I'm I don't claim to be the best compliance officer in the world. I'm not the best behavioural scientist in the world. I'm kind of trying to bridge those two gaps. So thank you for saying that because that's precisely what I'm trying to do. Hey, Nick here once more. A final farewell note before ending. All the show notes, links to papers, resources, and materials mentioned in the episode can be found on the BS Podcast page of The Behaviorist, where you can find all episodes and lots of other interesting, easy-to-apply, sciencey stuff. Just go to www.behaviorist.biz slash BS Podcast. And lastly, if you'd like to join me in the mission of spreading the good BS word, remember to rate and review the show on iTunes. Why should you? Because one, you're a part of a digital-wide social proof exercise. Two, you're helping combat the negativity bias in the form of positive reviews. And three, it's a little pre-commitment for your habitual podcast listening. A little investment to keep you coming back for more BS. I mean, how much more behavioral can you get? Thanks again for listening. Until next time, remember, keep your facts ugly and your hypotheses beautiful.